Okay. We'll go ahead and wait maybe one more minute, wait for a few more people to join, and then we can go ahead and start the presentation. So. Now, can everybody hear okay? Is there any problem with any kind of audio issues or... Now, Esther, you can still hear me, right? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Now, if you're having any issues with audio, just make sure you click on that little button that says Connect Computer to Audio, and it should get you hooked up to our audio feed. Okay, so in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and start. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining. I'm Michael Molina. I'm with the Oklahoma Transportation Library and the Southern Plains Transportation Center. And this is our inaugural webinar that we're doing. We're going to have a few more webinars in the future, so stay tuned for those. We'll be emailing those out later. But our presenter today is Dr. Esther Mullins from the South Central Climate Science Center. And the way we're going to have this set up, we're going to go through the presentation first and then have a question and answer session afterwards. So if you have like a microphone, you can, you know, say your question or there should be a little chat box you can type your question into and that'll be after the presentation. So um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Mullins and we can start the presentation. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining this lunchtime. This is actually my first webinar. Um, so in my mind, I had it as sort of me talking by myself to a computer screen, which I have done uh, on in fairness, but uh, not for a whole hour. So, so I really appreciate you joining me today. Uh, a bit about me, I am a postdoc um, researcher. Uh, my background is in atmospheric science and meteorology. Um, I realized fairly early on, I'm not of the, um, the technical mindset to do engineering, um, but it's been a really fun few years as I've learned an awful lot about uh, transportation um, side of things. But today I'm gonna present some information um, about some of our regional uh, climate trends, and I call that a climate trends roadmap for transportation. Uh, let me see. There we go. Um, I'd like to thank uh, a number of people that have helped with this. Um, so what I'm going to present has really been a collaborative effort amongst um, a few different organizations here. Of course, the Southern Plains Transportation Center. Um, has lent their expertise um, in insight uh, as we've gone through this work. Uh, other folks at the South Central Climate Science Center um, and the uh, Southern Climate Impact Planning Program, which is another group here in Norman that deals with climate issues, and the OU School of Meteorology. So I'm sure that we're all familiar um, with the fact that weather and climate can impact transportation. It may not necessarily be the number one thing we think of um, if, we're, if we're sort of going about our day-to-day -day work in that sector, but um, just a few things. Um, design, for example, uh, almost everything that we do um, is underpinned by um, climate, particularly as our infrastructure um, is perennially exposed to weather and climate um, throughout its lifetime. So here's just a few examples. Um, rainfall used when we consider um, drainage and flooding issues along with other factors such as the land surface. Um, when dealing with road surfaces, uh, you need to know about the, the maximum potential temperature uh, you get at that surface or below that surface um, in hot conditions, in traffic conditions, and also extremely cold conditions. And also in bridge design, um, the issues of, of um, solar radiation and unequal temperature gradients across the bridge structure. In maintenance, uh, the, we deal with the exposure to weather and climate, um, responding to that as it's happening and also after the event has occurred. Uh, so here's just a few examples, extreme heat, looking outside in that and snow and ice. Um, results from uh, severe winter weather and 
and freeze thaw cycles and also flooding. So this bottom uh, figure that you see here is actually from eastern Oklahoma in 2015 uh, when the flooding um, led to erosion um, that of that road and produced those enormous cracks that you see there. And then for the, for, our, for the rest of us, in you know, just general society has to uh, kind of, you know, uses the transportation network, uh, the issues of safety uh, come in when we think of uh, wildfires, dust storms, uh, road closures and diversions, uh, tracks uh, dealing with um, extreme heat or extreme cold and icing. Uh, I believe that picture of those cars all over the place is from the Atlanta area a few years ago when they had an unusual um, episode of winter weather. And then, of course, every, in everyone's minds last year, um, Hurricane Harvey and the impacts of flooding in the Houston area. So with all of that, we, we know, you know, if we've lived in Oklahoma or anywhere in the Southern Plains, we've dealt with almost every type of extreme you could imagine. Um, in fact, I used to joke to people back in England, where I'm from, that really anything we tend to get is a volcanic eruption, but almost everything else we deal with. So climate variability, extreme weather is, is something that, is, that people have, have a lot of experience with. Uh, so over the years, you know, we may they have a, a big flood or ice storms or heat waves or cold waves, all these things uh, can happen. But generally, for a lot of us, we, we just assume throughout our life that um, the climate that we started with is the climate that we're going to end with. But that's assuming that we live in the same location that I do, which is moved to a completely different climate. So this is just an example of, of climate variability, these ups and downs, these wiggles in our in our temperature trend or a precipitation trend just indicate um, that our, our climate system varies and we can have some very extreme conditions as part of that. So if our, with the, the assumption of a stationary climate, then we can look in the past and we can look at past extreme conditions and those um, can help inform the types of uh, drainage that uh, that we need the types of infrastructure design uh, parameters. However, what if our climate is not stationary? What if there's a trend uh, that is occurring? Um, that rather changes the situation. Um, in some cases, um, we may be better off, maybe less uh, cold conditions, but in other uh, areas, we may find ourselves having uh, issues or seeing extremes in the types of frequencies or magnitudes that we've not previously encountered them. And in that condition, assuming a non-stationary climate, it's not as, um, we can't necessarily take what we've seen in the past and apply it uh, to the future as well. So uh, this is a quote that I've used before and I quite like it. Um, I don't actually know who it's by, um, whoever this person is, it's a nice quote. Um, and he just says, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is to act with yesterday's logic. And I change that a little bit. And I say the greatest danger in times of climate change is to act only with yesterday's climate. Now, that may be a little bit hyperbole in a sense. It's not the climate is not the only thing we have to consider in engineering or in anything, really. But um, if we have a climate that isn't um, the same in the future as it was in the past, then o acting only with our past climate is not going to tell us the full story when we get into the future. And this is particularly true when you look at long duration and very high value infrastructure that's designed to be there for a long period of time. If anyone's interested, this picture comes from my father, who was a transportation planner in the UK, and I have no idea how the bus ended in the, up in that hole, but it makes for a good picture. And then, of course, there's the elephant in the room. When we think of uh, climate change, um, it's one of those uh, words now that, that, you know, like politics and religion, it's hard to bring up those types of things at the dinner table unless you know the people very, very well. And even then, uh, it's become a highly politicized subject, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. I know um, that... Uh, that there's a lot of implications if the climate is changing, what that means uh, for society, for regulation, and things like that. Um, however, um, I'm presenting what I understand from my experience and my professional expertise. Um, I'm assuming that if you're listening, you have some basic understanding of climate change and its causes. 
Um, however, please feel free to um, talk to me offline um, if you'd like some more information on that. So as we were going about our project, the main area that we were tackling was really just just one particular step um, in getting to I think it's gone. Okay, yeah, that, that sounds better. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so the Federal Highways Administration has been doing a, a lot of work in recent years to help uh, trans transportation agencies recognize uh, the impacts of climate variability and climate change and build resilience. Our particular part of that was just this first step. Know your vulnerabilities. Um, and we were tackling that from the climate angle. So that's really only part of the step. The other part of the step comes to how those climate um, trends impact specific assets. Um, but our mission was to provide uh, transportation relevant climate trends at the regional level for each state in the SPTC region six. So that's five states. And to make this information accessible, um, and I will show you in a minute what that is, uh, what that looks like. And a no less important aim was to get a conversation started. So this is still an emerging topic. Um, there are the other standards and design parameters uh, that are specific to transportation agencies, <coughs> and and incorporating new information may not be all that easy. Um, it's just you know learning about this information, talking across disciplines. Um, so ultimately, how we as climate folk and engineering folk and um, in various subsectors can help each other um, with these types of problems. So the way that uh, that we tackle our know your vulnerabilities um, was obviously we did a, a research. Um, project a few years ago and you know out of that you create a nice uh, document, a final report and uh, you know you spend a lot of time creating it um, and then it typically goes and sits somewhere and in, you know I I like to write a lot so then I realized you know I didn't even want to read what I'd written. Um, so we took that information <laughs> and broke it down into the different uh, into different states. In each of these, um, we look at uh, various things that were considered to be important based on um, some information we would gathered from transportation professionals in the region. I'm going to go through what, this, uh, what these uh, summaries will look like look at, uh, using the Oklahoma State Summary as an example. Um, I'm sorry if you can't see all of this information all that well. These are just screenshots of the pages from the document itself. Um, I'm going to really bring out the major points um, for each so that you don't need to worry about reading through everything that's on here. Um, so we formatted these uh, to consider um, basically the same types of um, uh, climate information <coughs> from each of these states. Um, and using, when possible, some sub-regional information. So we've got our state-level uh, trends and projections, and then we use uh, smaller regions within that. Um, variables that we consider include winter, um, weather such as um, freezing, boring, um, winter, whether it's snow and ice. We also then turn to look at heat, at drought, um, and extreme precipitation as well, and we bring in case studies of uh, historical events in the region and for historical extremes. We then have a resources section um, that talks about um, some current uh, information and websites and resources available from the transportation community that specifically looks at climate. Um, and then an appendix which addresses more technical information, such as what uh, data sets we used to create trends. So if you don't have a lot of time, obviously the executive summary is the main place to start. It's just a single page talks about why we did it, why it's important, um, and what we, uh, what kinds of results we got for each individual state. 
and that's at the very uh, bottom of this first page. So if you go as far as that, you kind of get the, the gist. But then we present uh, our evidence for our claims, you know, on the identical document. Um, for each summary, we consider there are a number of different uh, sectors in transportation, just a, a broad approach, which considers the, uh, the scope of the transportation network in each state. And then these icons that um, highlight different, you know, so roads or trains, cars, uh, bridges. We also consider things like drainage. Um, so the types of lifetimes associated with that, the capacity, um, and any weather-related stresses that then bring that around to, to show you why uh, these types of things are, have some sensitivity to weather or climate impacts. So we use those icons in, in the different parts of the document to indicate uh, what types of weather or climate trend they could potentially be impacted by. Uh, we consider the historical climate of the region and some of the recent trends. So just in general, uh, all of this information is um, is laid out to be uh, um, accessible. It's not overly technical. Uh, included in a number of um, citations to other resources. Um, so we talk about uh, what, what Oklahoma's climate is, what the, the trends have recently been, um, and uh, then bring in some information such as what have we been seeing in terms of the historical extremes. So here, for example, um, this uh, figure at the bottom shows billion dollar weather disasters that have impacted the state of Oklahoma in the past 30 years. And what's interesting here is you can see that in recent years there's been a uptick in uh, billion dollar disasters in the region associated with uh, severe storms, for example. Um, we can't say whether or not that's an atmosphere atmospheric things such as you know increases in those types of events or whether it's uh, due to more social or economic issues such as uh, growing population um, but in general you see there's some vulnerabilities there uh, a section addresses um, how we determined what information to use so uh, we did um, conduct a survey back in late 2015 and had a number of participants um, and in that survey we um, wanted to know um, about the types of weather and climate variables that are particularly of interest. Um, the threshold for that information, such as like um, with heat, for example, what would be considered adverse heat. Um, and that obviously varies depending on where you are in the region. Um, but in general, there were some commonalities. So this uh, word map here just indicates some of the, the variables that were considered to be most uh, of interest. And since it was 2015 and we were coming out of a very wet year, rainfall and flooding was very high up there. Um, but you also see just, again, um, hot, cold, snow and ice, and things like that. So those are ones we got uh, in this document. We look at some general thresholds, um, such as with heat, 100 degrees tended to be a cutoff um, between what be considered okay versus not so okay. Um, but again, it kind of depended. Down in Louisiana and Arkansas, 95 degrees, which is what we're going to come in there as a threshold for very hot conditions. Cold, snowfall, and rainfall. Um, also, we looked at some thresholds. Um, rainfall was a little bit more mixed, and it really did depend on on the type of uh, problem that people were addressing, whether or not they were interested in a fixed threshold, such as a two-inch event in a day or a return period. We ended up looking at return periods, um, and then we also provide a, you know, just a little bit of information about why we didn't consider things like uh, tornadoes, and simply the data that we were using did not does not have the ability to resolve that type of information. This is an example of uh, one particular type of um, climate trend. So we uh, typically lay these over two or three pages that deal with the past conditions and then the future projected conditions based on the climate models that we were using. And we were using multiple climate models. Um, and that is, again, I won't go into that at this time, but a lot of that information is available in the final report for this project. Um, and I will show you where you can find that. And also um, in the appendix of each one of these summaries, there's some information on the specific climate information we were using. Uh, so we start with historical trends or what's notable about each state. So for example, with Oklahoma, um, 
we find that snowfall is, is more common in the, in the northern uh, half of the state. And then as you head south, the winter weather that you typically see is more of the ice and sleet mix. Winter precipitation has not shown much of a trend. Um, it's generally been very high, highly variable. Some years you see a lot and some years you won't see any. Um, but in the decade of 2000 to 2010, Oklahoma experienced a number of disruptive winter storms, as I'm sure those of you who are in Oklahoma can recall, a number of very damaging ice storms. Um, so this is kind of the, the historical um, kind of status quo, that we're like what's going, what we have experienced. Then as we move ahead, so this is the information now that's coming from the climate models. And so these pages are laid out at the top just to um, show the salient point. So typically, um, whether something is increasing or decreasing in the future, uh, the types of percentage increases or decreases that we are seeing, um, then any caveats about the data, any information about the data that could be pertinent, and then how this could impact transportation um, just in a general sense. And then a confidence estimate. And so I'll talk about confidence a little later on. Um, this figure. I'm just going to go through this. So I, as part of this document, we do um, have a page that talks about climate modeling, what that means um, just in general, and how climate models differ from weather models. And we also introduced this idea of emission scenarios, which, are, which describe um, kind of potential future pathways in greenhouse gas emissions um, in the coming decades, centuries. Um, so uh, we have some MR here and then H. There are two emission scenarios we looked at. Um, Mid-range and high is what I designate them as. Mid-range, uh, in general, um, depicts the pathway where um, we emit greenhouse gases um, conti that, that continue to increase uh, throughout at least the mid-21st century and thereafter um, for various, you know, they don't really specify in necessarily the reasons, um, but the, the expectation in that scenario would be that we'd level off and then gradually decline after that through the late 21st century. So that's called mid-range. High is if you took the kinds of um, emissions that we're currently producing and you just continue to grow that out through the 21st century, that would be a high emission scenario. Um, just, uh, we lay this spatial information out uh, as this four panel, and this is um, basically the average of all the models that we that we use. Um, the two time periods, okay, um, a, a kind of a mid-century time period, the next 30 odd years, and then a later century. So for many of us um, with shorter timelines, um, the mid-century perhaps is going to be uh, of more interest. But then for certain types of long duration infrastructure, we may even want to see further out beyond that. So um, you see here that this is a percentage change uh, in the frequency of winter weather is resolved by climate models um, relative to a 1971 to 2000 mean. Um, and so in the, in the mid-century period, the difference between these two emission scenarios isn't all that large. You can generally see, um, as you might expect, if, if we are in a warmer climate situation, less overall winter weather. Um, in the latter part of the century, you begin to see the differences um, appearing in particular with high emissions and with a higher decrease in winter weather. Now, this doesn't say anything about intensity. And what we tended to find is that intensity doesn't really change. It's the frequency that does. So um, winter storms in the future could still be intense, just not necessarily as frequent. Um, another thing that we do in these um, summaries is to look um, at subregions. So this is an example of future heat in central Oklahoma. And central Oklahoma is um, uh, defined as Oklahoma Climate Division 5. So I'm just going to click forward for a second. If you're not familiar with climate divisions, these are um, geographical regions within each state that denote a similar um, climate in general. It gets a little bit more complicated when you're in uh, topographically diverse regions such as New Mexico. But um, in trying to determine a region in city, you could go down to the county level, but then you have data coming out of your ears, so it's just a little easier to, to look at these types of domains, not to mention for many variables 
what you see in terms of the trend for the whole domain is more than likely what you're going to see if you were to go down to the level of a, of a county or even a city, which they can um, do. But anyway, we look at Oklahoma um, Climate Division 5. And so this information here is a time series. So for example, for maximum temperature, maximum annual temperature um, in the year, we pick that and indicate uh, that that goes up, for example, by up to 10 degrees Fahrenheit later in the century. That um, in that time series on the top, you see a range, and that range is to do with all the different models that we've been uh, that we look at. We also try and bring in some um, some sort of historically relevant information. So if you um, have lived and worked in central Oklahoma or even or any part of Oklahoma for a while, you might remember the summer of 2011 where we had um, a significant drought um, and also just significant heat. And so if you take a year like that and then you look uh, in the model data at how, how common that year might be looking out into the future, that's one way to kind of give you a sense of what uh, what this, these future conditions may look like. Um, so, for example, here, based on all the, the average of all the models we looked at, um, you see that by 2040, that type of year could occur once every 30 years. And given that in the historical period it, it never had occurred in over 100 years of record, that is indeed an increase. Um, and then you really see by the mid century that if you're with the high emissions pathway, that, um, that this type of year becomes increasingly the normal type of year by later in the century. Um, and we use two different emissions pathways because honestly, we don't know what path uh, people are going to take in the future. And so um, having more than one pathway kind of gets you to see where the potential lies for different types of um, future trends. Um, finally, we look at heavy precipitation. And this is just, a, again, another example of um, bringing out some sub-regional information and uh, there's just a ton of information here so I'm not um, I'm not gonna um, expect you to immediately <laughs> want to read all that um, but ultimately what we did see from the models in general was an increase in the frequency of extreme rainfall um, what we uh, did with with the precipitation data uh, on the climate division level was to extract the, the highest precipitation for a given year and then um, look at extreme value theory, so um, using extreme value distributions to um, get return periods for that uh, using daily data. And so we were able to resolve like the 100-year rainfall, for example. Um, however, um, the, the actual magnitude of that really does depend a lot on the extreme value distribution that you use um, and so we use two different types one that was a little bit more conservative which is the gumball um, extreme value distribution and then another one the generalized extreme value distribution um, and so um, yeah basically we talk a little bit about some of the uncertainty but that's resolving for example the historical 100 year storm so what we currently think of as a 100 year event and then looking at outward into the future and how uh, much the potential expected frequency could could increase or decrease with that overall um, the by the mid or late 21st century that type of event becomes about three or four times more frequent um, statistically um, the interesting thing about this was there was less of a dependency on the emissions pathway and more of a dependency on which model you used in terms of how um, extreme the uh, expected future precipitation could be. The last section in each one of these documents is generally the same, although we try and bring in a case study of um, some type of activity in each state or in a nearby state if there's not one available for that state uh, that, that looks at how, um, how climate information has been incorporated into um, some sort of adaptation or resiliency study. So here we just um, kind of highlight why we do this, why, why, and so again, historical data may not um, capture what we might experience in the future. We then lay out some resources that are available, so different um, groups, different agencies 
have all tackled um, climate to some degree um, in the past or currently. Um, and so each one of these is active links um, in the document that allows you to go to those websites and look at those resources. We talk a little bit about the Federal Highways Administration pilot studies, which went on from 2010 through about 2015. I believe there's another call now um, for proposals um, to look at resiliency against weather extremes. And uh, so there are various different parts of the country that looked at that and tried to collect that information. We include some resources, and the main resources that we included are ones that were developed by transportation agencies. So obviously the project that we did here um, did output a number of um, data sets. Um, given some of the specific requirements, um, so if, for example, standards and things like that, um, there are some other resources that uh, you may want to consider. Um, so the Federal Highway Administration has a number of those, and those are linked here as well. Um, finally, um, so again, this is an emerging area. Um, one of the things that if anyone has some sort of interest in looking at climate, um, particularly you know future climate, but also historical climate and, and extremes in, in the historical period, um, then Places like the South Central Climate Science Center and the Southern Climate Impact Planning Program have a number of folks that would be very interested to talk to you about that. Um, we have access to a lot of information, a lot of data sets, um, if that's what you're interested in. And finally, our appendix, if you want to get more technical information, such as exactly what climate models we used and where they are, and things like that, that's all in there. The, this confidence. Um, estimate that we use across the document is based on, in general, on an approach used by the um, National Climate Assessment, which is a large document uh, that comes out every four years. The next one is expected actually this year. Um, and so uh, we have high, medium, low. And sometimes it's a little difficult to exactly specify whether something's medium or low. So we use typically like, well, medium, low, or medium, high. Um, generally, um, Considering whether the models agree on the direction of change, whether there's a lot of supporting evidence in the literature, in other studies that agree on the direction of change, um, whether the methods um, have large or low uncertainties and things like that goes into whether or not um, something is considered high, medium, or low confidence. So finally, um, I have a few, these are just questions that I thought people might ask. Uh, um, so let's see, where can I get these documents? So we've just um, released a project website. And um, I believe this PowerPoint is going to get paid. So if anyone's interested, then um, please just uh, go back and look at the PowerPoint, or you can write it down now. Um, that website um, just provides an overview of the project. And then there's a tab called State Summaries. And you can go to each one of the five states in the region and download the PDF the full PDF of these summaries for your region. For some people, if they're in Texas and Louisiana, coastal issues are extremely important in those areas. We did not um, specifically analyze sea level rise in any of the data that we're looking at, but we did provide some resources and further reading for the Texas and Louisiana state summaries. If you're interested in data sets, or graphics using this work. So anything from these PDFs, any one of those graphics you can use. Um, there is a suggested citation, but you can pretty much anything you can use um, for your own um, interest or in any projects, or if you just want to kind of tell your friends, that kind of thing. So uh, we're populating a basic data portal with graphics and data sets. And when I say basic, I really do mean basic. I'm actually going to show you right now. Uh, we expect to have a lot of that data uh, um, in the next few months. So here it is. It's just a simple file list. So data figures, um, and then the final project uh, is available up there as well um, in Word format. But uh, I will provide a full kind of user guide to that because, I mean, I'd love to be able to build a really nice portal, um, but it's unfortunately not going to happen. It is uh, what the... Um, 
website looks like. And again, if you go to state summaries, you click down, and then you can download uh, the full report here if you're interested. Could be dragging something back. There we go. Okay, well, that is all for me. Thank you very much. If you want to, if you are interested in this line of work and you want to provide any feedback to those resources, I'd be happy to hear it. Um, here is my contact information. I will be transitioning to another institution later this year, so there are two email addresses available there. The Gmail one would be uh, after August of this year. Thank you for your time. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Esther. And uh, are there any questions for Dr. Mullen? If you're hooked up with a microphone, you can feel free to ask any questions, or you can also use the chat box in your uh, in the WebEx platform. Uh, was someone trying to say something? I could barely hear something. All right. Uh, any questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Mullins. I appreciate your time and appreciate everybody for participating. So we'll go ahead and send a link out to this presentation. We'll post it on our website and we'll attach the PowerPoint too if anyone's interested in that. So yeah, if anyone has any questions after the fact, feel free to email Dr. Mullins or myself about anything. And uh, just thanks again for participating and hope everyone has a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.